Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for May 28th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the State Delegation Update State Senator Pat Jalen and Representative Christine Barber. Welcome to you both. Um, my apologies in advance for the hat. As I told you before we started a roll, it's a bad hair day at the virtual studios. Senator Jalen, how are you doing today? I am good, and I'm glad to see if you're not going out and getting your hair cut yet. <laughs> no. It's Somerville, and we're glad. We're, I, you know. I am frightened to see what this is going to look like when, uh, you know, we finally do get back. But um, Christine Barber, always looking good, no matter the length of the hair. <laughs> it's very long right now, but thank you, Joe. Nice to see you in your hat. Thank you for having us here today. Um, glad to be here. Thank you. Um, for anybody who doesn't know the logo on the hat, it's uh, life is good. And that's the way I kind of um, want to look at how we struggle through the, the days ahead. But I do want to say one thing before we start, and it's your show. Um, yesterday was a milestone in the pandemic. We have 100,000 people dead. We have 41 million people out of work. And I don't think any of us especially the work that you do, Senator Jalen, Rep. Arbor, and the other state delegation, I don't think you forget that for one day in terms of the work that you do for your constituents. But there are a lot of people who are ready to move on. They're ready to begin uh, life again under some changes. But let's not forget that we have 100,000 people dead in this country due to the COVID pandemic. And we have a lot more people who are still alive, thankfully, but they're suffering because they're out of work and they're worried. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Jalen. Senator Jalen, the update on the Senate side from Beacon Hill. Well, let me, let me first just react to what you just said. Yeah, uh, at least a quarter of the people in Massachusetts no longer have jobs. And thank goodness for the federal government sending us assistance for unemployment for those people most of them. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but in terms of being ready to go back to work and get out and stop wearing masks and gathering, um, we talked about we're all in it together. Just because you feel good and hopeful doesn't mean that you should endanger other people by going out and getting together with people uh, it's just not responsible to your neighbors uh, that you may be safe, but if we don't all take care of each other, uh, we will all fall separately. So, um, but actually I have very good news today. Well, it's not good news, is it? It's news, uh, which is that uh, the state finally started publishing the numbers of people from each nursing home who have died in the state. Uh, we have been, talking to them about that, asking for that for over a month uh, when we exact a bill out of a elder affairs that required them to do that. We've been, we will finally pass that bill today. Um, there was a lot of negotiation, but they have known the numbers for six weeks at least. And they knew what a disaster it was in nursing facilities like the two in Medford where I represent. It's almost a hundred people in those two nursing homes have died. And the reason we wanted that information is that we wanted to be able to target assistance. Those nursing homes were telling me that they needed more staff. They were down by at least 40% in the number of people they needed to care for people. They had 30 people in one nursing home waiting to be fed because they were too weak and they didn't have enough assistance to feed them, let alone change them or help them go to the toilet. So it took a long time after we started asking for them to get assistance. It's not, they started doing it, I think, because of the legislation, because of the news media and because of the fact that Medicare would publish that in those numbers this week. There is no excuse for that. But here's why it's important. Last night, last week, they started reporting about the Department of Corrections. And there's at least two um, 
facilities where there are zero cases uh, of corona, either in staff or in inmates. They can stop isolating people right now. And they should, because there's no reason to segregate people if no one is positive. But the second reason is that they all, that yesterday they also started publishing information about congregate housing, such as homeless shelters. It turns out that at Pine Street Inn, there are 36 positive cases. That's horrifying. That's dangerous. And so there is federal money available if we apply this month, which is very short, to get money, a uh, 75% match, to, to deinstitutionalize those people and get them out of congregate housing and into uh, less dangerous and more uh, permanent housing. So there's a letter today from legislators that we're signing on to, but that information is important. It targets resources. So I'm very glad that's finally happening. Anyway, um, so good news in a one way that we're getting information, bad news in another way that the information is so terrifying. So I think a little later, we've got um, a graph that your staff had put together. And when, when we hear from um, Christine Barber, we're gonna go back to that. And, and, and it's interesting what the district, folks in your district are saying, but Rep Barber on the State House side, what have we got since last week, last time you appeared? Thanks, Joe. Um, I also, I wanted to um, echo some of what Senator Jalen said at the top of the hour. And you said, I mean, given this really somber milestone that we've hit and the reopening, um, I, I believe you've had Mike Connolly on recently and he's talked about the work he's done and I've partnered with him on some of this on really being cautious around the reopening. And it's not that we know there's been an economic disaster. This has been an economic disaster with the, the businesses out of work, the businesses perhaps not coming back, um, but empl employees who are really suffering, but that we have to be really careful with the reopening and have, I think, clearer messaging than is out there now that people, that we do need to still wear masks, stay socially distant, not um, come together in groups, even though it is really hard and we are um, really struggling with that. Um, but thinking of, the frontline workers, they're still out there. They are still at risk and we need to keep thinking of them. You know, the grocery store workers, the PCAs, all the folks who are really still on the front line and most at risk right now. Um, that said, I also have some good news, which is perhaps a little better news than what Senator Jan delivered. But we've been working since the beginning of this disaster on unemployment benefits. Um, as you probably can imagine, our offices have helped dozens and dozens of people get connect with their unemployment benefits. It is not an easy system. Um, there's a lot of IT issues with it. I know this is something that Senator Jalen has worked on since you know before the COVID crisis and has been continuing to work on. But what we just learned that we've been pushing for is that the application is now translated into five languages and it's online. So this is really important because there aren't community groups where people can go and say, I need help with my application um, in my own language. And the language is really, and the application is really technical. So it's not easily uh, translatable. So it's now available online in Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, um, Vietnamese, and Chinese. And this is a, a really big deal and something that we've been pushing for. Um, and I wrote a letter about almost two months ago, and I appreciate that, um, that we're, we're getting there um, at the Department of Unemployment. Great, great, great. The work continues, no matter how difficult this gets, the work continues. Senator Jalen, I want to go back to you, and there is one, uh, one item that I wanted to try to carve out some time towards the end of the show, um, and that is about voting. What we're going to do about the voting system um, under certain restrictions that certain states, municipalities may employ for the November voting. But before we get to that, let's go, um, if you will, do you want to walk through the graph? Sure. Do you want to walk through? Sure. Adam, if you could put that up for us. 
And can I thank uh, Zoe Iacovino from my staff and also a Somerville High School graduate back from the days when they had graduations um, and for making this chart and for also responding to the close to 600 people who wrote about just these 10 issues, which are the top COVID related issues um, that people contacted us about in my office since the beginning of the emergency. Uh, it's really amazing, but let me just be clear. This is about half of the people who, who have written to us about other all total COVID related issues. And that's a portion of the people who've written to us about other issues, including individual problems, individual concerns, things like being the first to tell us about the problems at one of the nursing homes, things like telling us about all the problems they're having with getting unemployment, which help us work with the department to get that better. So, so Sen Senator Jalen, I just want to set this up a little bit. This is your district where this, this is my district. So your district. for yep. people in Somerville, uh, you are pink, right? I can't see the blue, I think. What? It looks like blue in Somerville. Blue, blue. I'm sorry. Pink is Cambridge. I'm sorry. Um, Winchester is orange. See, I don't see the the, the thing down at the bottom, but. Yeah, the chart may be cutting off, there it is. Okay, so Winchester is the orange bars, uh, Somerville is the blue bars, Medford is the purple bars, and Cambridge is the pink bars. But you, this is the top issues that people have written to us about, and you'll see there's over 500 communications in just this list. So, um, obviously, we're going to talk about vote by mail because that is the one where we have gotten the most uh, concerns, both in Somerville and across the district. Um, both Christine and I have worked really hard on the decarceration issue, which we may want to talk about a little bit. And I think I talked about it last time, but um, you can see that sick leaves that we want, that there is a bill before my Committee on Labor and Workforce Development that would allow people uh, to use uh, sick leave without, um, without drawing down their other sick leave from their employment, if it's for COVID. Uh, so that's obviously one that's been con a concern to people. Uh, the comprehensive response is a, is a list of many, many things that people would like us to do. So I'm not gonna go into that, but, and then hazard pay for essential employees is another that's very popular. But all of these are ones where many people have written to us. Uh, and you can see how active Somerville is uh, that, for example, vote by mail, we have probably uh, 55 people have written to us. And that's mostly recently about wanting to be able to vote by mail. The evictions one was relatively early before we passed the evictions and, and foreclosure bill. Um, but that was extremely popular at the time, especially in Somerville. And I mean, not, not uh, Senator Jalen, I'm sorry, not to cast any dispersions on your um, constituency in Winchester. It's just a much smaller sampling size. Winchester is much smaller than either right. any of the other communities, and I represent only half of it. Right. Okay. But we have it's extraordinarily active district and I'm really grateful for it. And, and, and it does seem it does seem like um, between Cambridge, Cambridge and Somerville, um, they are thinking almost exactly along the same lines. Um, interesting point. With very few exceptions. And then Medford, because that also has a smaller sampling size, we can't discount the, what they're it's saying as not well. Smaller. Right. It's not smaller. Right. It's about the same size as Sun River. Um, well, let's go to let's go to one of the things that is jumping out at me is that people are very very concerned about their health on this thing, um, which is understandable. We're in the middle of a, a health related pandemic. Um, are people are people prioritizing these things in any significant way other than the vote by mail? Or, or are you getting a general sense that if they had to choose, if, if I said to them or you said to them, 
out of these, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, out of these eight, now you have to whittle it down to three. Do you have a sense of what they're gonna pick? Well, let me be clear. These are organized emails, I think. They're people who have responded to a request to send in information or okay. are concerned to their legislators. So these are a marker of what um, networks people are part of. So these are not people who, who necessarily um, would write in and say, don't reopen or uh, protect me or quick reopen. So for those kinds of issues, then you look for other ways to find out what people are happening. Like tomorrow I'll be on, uh, Christine and I will be with the Met, no, are we? With the summer oh, chamber. Oh. And uh, also I'll be with the Winchester chamber and I'm pretty sure I know what kinds of questions uh, and concerns people will raise at those, uh, which are concerns uh, about being safe, but also being able to reopen safely, uh, that uh, people have felt are very scared. And I know it's a, I know it's a topic that we can put forth, but I did ask the city council when they were on this week, uh, the reaction to the governor's uh, reopening plan. What are you getting, Senator Jalen, and then we'll go over to Chris, Christine Barber. What are you getting from constituents? Do they feel comfortable with it? Are we going too fast, too slow, just about right? I think, I think it's really mixed. I think it depends on what your situation is. My understanding of polls is that people are appreciate the need to go slow, um, that we need that we need to I mean, when you say we've flattened the curve, it means that there's space in the, in, in the hospitals. It doesn't mean that the coronavirus is vanquished or going away. It means that there's flattening the curve means there's not as many, they're not flooding the hospitals right now. Yeah, and the virus is still out there. It's just waiting. It's waiting for another host to let their guard down and then infect them. Yeah. Christine, what are you hearing on the... Uh, you have a little larger section. What are you hearing over in Medford? What is their response to reopening? Um, I agree that it's mixed. So I hear from some who think we should be doing this more quickly, but for the most part, I agree that people are, are okay with going slow. Um, the Medford mayor has been really clear about, you know, taking precautions, staying safe, not um, quickly, you know, not congregating as groups. Um, and really, uh, one of the things I've been focused on that people are concerned about is what does it mean to start to go back to work? One of the big questions is early education and childcare. Um, mm -hmm. And really, that has not been uh, worked out in any way, I think, by the state. So most people can't just go back to work without having a plan for their kids. And um, right now, only emergency child care centers are open. And there is, I understand, some capacity there where if you need it, you can use those. Um, but as far as reopening the, the family and the center um, child care and early education centers, they're really, there's um, not yet a, a, a clear plan. Um, I'm on a house working group on early education and the reopening and something we're, we're trying to figure out is, you know, what is needed to, to keep children and providers safe and also to help providers, you know, stay open. These are mostly shoestring operations that were really struggling before this crisis and it's not going to be easy to restart uh, that part and that, you know, our economy does depend on that and, and of course the safety for families as well. I'm, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned it. Uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday we had uh, Lisa Q mm -hmm. from the Somerville Early, um, mm. Early Director of Early Education here in the city. And I promised her I would mention it on this show with the legislation, legislators, um, to support the CPPI refunding. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to me, because I do not have children in the public school system, Unbeknownst to me how early our education system starts here in Somerville with that program, that it is even prenatal. 
I mean, you know, people thinking about, have some resources here in the city about what it's like to bring a child into the world, what you have to start with, and then they move on and then gradually, is an awful way to say it, but there's a handoff to nursery schools or pre-care kindergartens and then kindergarten. And the way that you think about it is the earlier the child is beginning the education process, the better the results will be. So I had to put my, my plug in there on behalf of Lisa Q for asking the state delegation to please support the CPPI and re have it refunded. I do wanna go back over to um, voting because I don't wanna lose track that we do have a November um, election coming up, which is- We have important. a September election too, Joe. We do have, we do have the uh -huh. primary, we do have the primaries coming up in September, but because uh, you are a candidate, I'm gonna stay away from that and I'm gonna kind of go to the general sense of voting. So we have a system that has federal requirements, state requirements, and municipal requirements. It is a Michigas of all over the place of how people do things. You have some states who went to a mail by, uh, vote by mail ballot years ago, but it took them a while to get that perfected and get rid of some of the inconsistencies that they had, um, detection, security detection for voter fraud, all that stuff. What I wanted to talk about though is we have some options here in Massachusetts um, and different municipalities do it different ways. Here in Somerville, we have a very, very easy way and it's called absentee balloting. You request the ballot, they send it to you, you send it back. H how much more simple could we get? However, there is a new movement called let's mail a ballot out to everybody who's a registered voter and just send it out because of the pandemic. And when we get it back, it may take a little longer to declare who the winner is because these are hand counts versus electronic counts. But the big question I have is, where do you fall on this? And who's gonna pay for if we go to an alternative system that's gonna require a lot more money? You wanna take it away, Christine? Sure, um, so just for, for people to know the context, um, there are a number of bills in the State House, honestly too many to keep track, that have some different versions of what you just said. Um, I, I fall on, we, we definitely need a way to both preserve the integrity of our elections in, in, the, uh, in the early fall and fall and also keep people safe, of course. So what, um, you know, at the very least, no excuse absentee and really opening it up. So ensuring that everyone can get an absentee ballot who needs one and then figuring out how do we improve um, the access to make sure that's easy for people to do. You've hit the nail on the head of the big question is really about capacity and funding. Um, and it, it um, kind of can't be discounted that we have, a, as you said, a really cobbled together system. We have some small, small towns and communities that they have, you know, not a big staff doing all the elections work. Um, so we're also uh, trying to think through what's possible without overburdening or uh, really you know, costing a lot of money for the local communities too. Um, so it is complicated. We are talking about it a lot and I am very hopeful we have to vote on it soon. So I'm hopeful we will get there soon. And, and if we do vote on it or you, you folks vote on it, you think we're gonna be ready for September primaries and November general? Yes. <laughs> okay, Senator well, Jalen. I tell is that they just had two elections uh, last week, or this, this week? What week are we? Yeah, last week, the Senate elections. Last, last week. week, and 33% uh, and, uh, in one district and 44% in the other uh, voted by mail, uh, so, they were able to count them, and I didn't hear of any concerns about um, fraud. Um, I just remember that the president himself votes for by mail into Florida, which is a place which has had problems in the past. Uh, so it's curious that he would be concerned about it. 
In interesting that you bring that up because the last time we had a delay in declaring a winner was because of the way that Florida does their voting. No, no offense to Florida. I'm just saying, and, and you know, if you want to say I'm being political, I'll give equal opportunity to the Iowa caucus who tried some, <laughs> some they tried something different. They weren't prepared. It wasn't double tested and they had a mishigas of a result as well. So I, what I'm trying to get to is we're trying to react to a pandemic by made, making voters feel comfortable that they can vote and still be healthy. They're gonna abide by distancing, they're not waiting in lines. I, my own personal feeling on all of this is, welcome to the 21st century United States on how we should do our voting. I have long advocated for a safe, secure, convenient way of voting. And in my mind, that's electronic voting. A lot of people go, oh, no, 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 Joe, that's open to fraud. Everything is open to fraud by a shyster. Let me, let me just make that statement. If, if somebody wants to break in, they're gonna break in. They're gonna find a way. However, I think for the vast majority of people who vote in this country, they want consistency, they want convenience, and they want to be able to be secure that their vote is being counted and their vote is being heard. That's my, my soapbox. But I want to go back to one more thing about um, the media has a role to play in this because people expect the results the night of the election. We are hungry for the result. I think we're all gonna have to, if we go more and more for, by a ballot, mail in, mail out, however we're gonna choose to do this, we have to temper the electorate to say, do not expect those results the night of the election. Because yeah. hand counting is gonna take a lot longer than electronic counting. What are we hearing in terms of the debate on Beacon Hill though? Are there opponents in other parts of the state who say, no, our system is working perfectly fine. Let people go to the polls on election day and let them stand six feet apart. Are we getting any of that? I don't hear opposition. Uh, what I hear is uh, concerns, uh, mostly about the question of, of primaries. Do you have to get a note from your election commission saying, do you want a primary ballot even if you are not a member of a party? So one of the proposals is, if you want to vote in a primary election, you have to register uh, in that party, and then you will get one automatically. So that, that's the only kind of, uh, they're more technical concerns or boundary concerns that I hear. Um, but again, right now, we have to pass everything unanimously unless we go into formal session. And so I think we will have to we will probably have divided votes on this. I don't know what Christine thinks. So a couple of quick questions, and we probably only have about 30 seconds left. A um, couple of quick questions. Should we open up the voting process for longer than just election day? Should we have like a week's worth of, of election? We do have early voting. Okay. How about nationwide? Should we just do it nationwide and say, we got one week to vote? I mean, I, I'd be in favor of that. And the other question would be, um, uh, how, do we, how do we do this from a federal, state, and municipal level without infringing on sovereign rights of the states? I'm gonna, leave you, I'm gonna leave you both with that question because I'm getting, I'm getting the signal here that we're running out of time. State Senator Pat Jalen, Representative Christine Barber, as always, Thank you so much for carving out some time of your day, joining us here at the Somerville Media Center. Stay Always safe. Good to see you. Stay Thanks, safe. John. Nice to see you. You too. Stay safe. Stay informed. We'll see you next time.